Maybe it's the new one though. I remember. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
It's raining just Dugouts. 
Small groups of soldiers crouched at corners where the trench zigzagged and hurling fake grenades, then charged forward into smoke and noise, only to come to a shambling halt as the whistle was blown three times. And he leant against a section of trench, strengthened with woven branches, struggling for breath, feeling as if he might vomit. Spark colored stars floated in front of his eyes, blood pounded in his hands and head. He wore a layer of heat like sweat, like like a heat and sweat like a second shoe. That's that quote from the board. So if you do not make a note in your book yesterday, um, you'll catch some light on it. All over the corner. Above him, Ripper appeared strangely coloured against the skyline and calmly statuesque. Very good voice. Sergeant lit a cigarette, disposed of the match, and looked comfortably down at the men. Down on the men in the supposedly captured trench. And if you can do all that sort of work a bit further up the road, we might actually manage to kill a few of the bastards. And that, of course, is what this six folder job caper is all about. Bob caught Andy's eyes as they rested against the wall. Tin hat cooked, sweat running. He cleared his throat and spat. I uh, see a few problems with this actual jumping into the enemy trench, he said quietly. One being that the bastards will probably be in it. Another being that they probably won't like it. Andy nodded. His hand seemed to swell with each beat of his heart. He felt the kind of mad elation as if the road they'd embarked upon had suddenly dipped down so steeply that there was no question of ever turning back or aside. Yeah, not right, he said. There seems to be something kind of a lacking in the planning. Yeah, it's called imagination. Darcy jumped to cut. And the element of surprise. Sometimes when um, people have drills, you know, in all the fake shooting and bayoneting, someone gets stabbed in the heart with a bayonet. And unfortunately for the family, that person was... Jesse, ah. I'm so sorry. Sorry. You were a valiant soldier. I know you never actually got to the war to actually fight, but you did everybody proud. Okay. Flip back to page 32, please. Sorry, Jesse. Flip back to page 32. Find that quote. Thin and whippy, 
soldiers up. So it's all just it's all just a description of what is on the photograph. Um, so if, if you want to mark that in your book somewhere, um, you will like um, Jen has anticipated here. You will need to actually put this quote down into your book, um, but mark it off in your book. Uh, the soldiers puff and he was right at the camera grinning actually as if anyone was welcome to join them. This wall below was nothing more than a walk in the park. So the photograph is taken before they actually get to walk. Um, probably looks like see in the background a I mean, class photo but, but sort of a bit more candid. Um, and Henry, uh, Annie's the only one not looking at the, at the camera. And um, Henry mentions the trees. Why does Henry mention the trees? What were we talking about yesterday? Yeah. Um, remember how we were talking about the, the, the language of the landscape to show character, kind of like Oswald uses the house to show character? Um, most times, Andy is given characterization in the landscape. Um, not as much Henry, but definitely Andy. So, Henry describes the trees, the, the, the leaves are like stars, the branches are seen in the peak, um, and the soldiers uh, have this kind of camaraderie, they're all together, they're all standing, staring at the camera. Um, so, we're talking about language techniques yesterday, um, and this is an example for you. So, Copy some of the quote down. Maybe I can help you to actually make that a bit smaller for you. Um. Maybe just... But then make sure that you know that you're talking about the word as well. Dad got it for me. I bought the book. Yeah. That's nice. So you can't. I found it's hard to copy and paste so from a, from an ebook. It is. I'm just gonna try. What page? You could take a screenshot. Yeah, you could. <laughs> So 
were the technique words like clenched and grinning serve to create a tension that illustrates the world around those in the photographs. The descriptive words rough, bark, thin and pithy are used as a tree, yet they could also be used as a soldier. Does that make sense? Oh, do you get it? See the landscape represented. Do you think this style is effective? Like these sort of long descriptions are effective? Yeah? Is it kind of picture of what it's like? Becomes a bit much sometimes when there's too much of a dynamic money. Like when there's a lot of description, 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 you just want to know what happens to the characters. Yeah, I'm not too fine that like you get a long description at the start of the scene and then the Yeah. Like, you know, so but boys of blood and bone, what do you think? I, I found that it was a bit more constant. Like those descriptions yeah. rather than the one long description. Yeah. So it's kind of digestible to look at a couple of excerpts sometimes, but then reading the whole thing it it's a lot more work than another novel, isn't it? Yeah. More of a marathon than a sprint. Yeah. I think that's probably why many of you don't enjoy it as much as I do or others, is because of the long description. Um, and all I can say to that is maybe get used to the style or 
skin every now and then. Um, but if, if you do tend to use good characterization, because medicine and his technique is to use the study to describe the character. So um, that's sort of a catch-22.
I'd like to stop now. Darcy extracted the thumb from under, under the strap and wait for the pie chart to catch up. This, this hiking's gone past a joke. I could be quite happy snoozing in that paddock right there, in that grassy corner. Well, just ask, said Bob. I'm sure Rick will be right. He nodded, slouch hat worn low. Looks like a nice little town coming anyway. So I guess we'll all, we'll all be into the pub for lunch, a few pots and a game starts. Yeah, Bob, and he said, you'd be on the money there, mate. The village ahead seemed to have imploded into low red heat of the rubble. Although the road, arrow straight and cobbled, glanced to it like a backbone that would never buckle. The colours of destruction, bright and split brick and dusty splintered timber made Annie think of the intestines and up uh, intestines and bones of the butchered animals. Rooted, said Darcy, surveying a couple of acres of shattered buildings. Like me, absolutely. The troops moved back through the ruins on the relentlessly straight road, brick walls blasted apart on either side, rafters supporting nothing but air and a few scabs of plate. The plate smelling not of death or decay, but of pulverized stone. It was a bit like Annie Bell walking through a play on the stage, the walls of a few houses and shops rising, and real enough, but flat like the scenery painted on canvas. That has been his job to, to move between acts for the annual strap of high school show. Nothing a few barrows of mortar and a few dozen bricks would fix, a boarding ex soldier said. These Frenchies are just plain bone lazy. I put up this joint cleaned up in an afternoon. The rubble piled high piled thick high beside the road, served to direct the movement and sighted the troops forward. In front, Annie could see long lines of waiting transport teams, the horses standing out to him like nothing else. The deep colours of their hearts pulling at his vision last thoughts of home. His horses grazing in pale grass at Kuyo, <coughs> led him on to think about Cecilia, coolly regarding him from under her wide brimmed Melbourne board hat as she stood in the shade of her veranda. And then he thought of Francis, who glowed like moonlight in the darkness, irresistible and available, desire and an overwhelming force between them. Annie marched on, head down, listening to hundreds of pairs of boots crunching, the lamp opening out into fields empty and sick looking. Scarred with old shell holes, turned over or abandoned to the army, it seemed to do with what they liked. She's warm, Bob looked to the sun, which shone through the torn clouds. Funny, I didn't expect it to be. I thought it'd be like, I don't know, cold, freezing. He shrugged the shoulder that his rifle wasn't on. Not like this. I didn't expect trees. I didn't expect nothing, but there you go. He pointed. Poplar trees stood like fine coloured feathers in short formal lines. This is like bloody Dorsdale or something, without cows. Bloody smells different, Darcy sniffed hard, nostrils closing, his nose sharpening. Smells like bloody mud, and look at it, he tilted his head forward towards the roadside. It's just some hopeless, useless, flipping flat stuff that someone said would be good for enough for battle. I mean, look at it, worth fighting over. That strikes me. These gritsies must be more dense than I thought, not to mention us for coming all this way to the bloody party. Andy looked, not at the land, but at the boys' heads, their hair, below their hats, all the mixed colours of a herd of horses, men in a line, going up to the line, whatever exactly the line was. It was something, though, Andy knew. The line was definitely something. The line was something he could not truly imagine, but it was certainly real. And he and the boys would go there, and then they would go beyond it, through whatever was there, a ride, perhaps somewhere on the other side. Suddenly, here's the quote, she underlined it, suddenly it felt like all his life had been marching to the line, that there really had never been anything more important and bigger than the line, that the line had always been waiting for him, had always been there, the horizon of the new world, the final place of all the places he would go, and then hopefully go back from, to places known, old and understood.
to war. We're probably not going to come back because we're leaving in 1916, 17, which means he knows that the, what the war is like, right? It's not 1914 when they don't know anything about it. They do know a bit about it. They do think it's going to be an adventure, but by this stage in the war, they know that it's not going to be six months. James, put your thing to you. Um, so, a lot of this uh, comes from there being no future. And so people start to do things. Actually, it was probably the first of the Yolo generation before they went to war because they would, would just do whatever they wanted because they were maybe going to die. What's the matter yeah. after that? What do you mean? Well, after, like, you know, so all the fashion changed, all the... Yeah, like, it like, was before they, before they left. Before they left, yeah. Well, like, I want to point out, what is it? Do you usually soldiers survive the war? Because when you're on the front lines, you're usually there for, like, um, four or five days, and then you get rotated back for the rest of the month. Just in the reserve conditions. I probably wouldn't like those odds if it were me, one in ten. I think no, I'd like to. No, if you're on the front line, though, there's not, like, well, he said one in ten. Oh, if you're on the front line, you usually die if they yeah. decide to lead a charge. Um, so they never got the
Do I need to read this one too? Yes. Um, page 135. So I know this is going to be a bit further on than where a lot of you are up to. But we've done a pretty good um, job at covering all the main chunks from Andy's um, narrative so far. Okay? Okay, so July 26, 1917, um, and I'll read the diary bit and then the, the narrative. In support trenches. It's a world of zone, trenches everywhere, endless miles of them with names and signposts, dugouts, dugouts to sleep in, settling in, firing constant now, never a dull moment. And he turned, the wind blowing hard on the side of his face, to see that the farmhouse and barn, where the pumpkins and shelters were far behind and becoming less clear, like a cluster of old pleasant memories. The land around rose to a few low ridges, some bare, some wooded, yet more of it was like was flat like a board for a game to be played out on, puffs of distant grey and white smoke drifting across it like balloons, broken loose from distant moorings. The soldiers talked excitedly. Shell burst, someone said with authority. There you go, boys, bloody shell burst. Um, I suppose someone can do like a shell burst sound effect. <laughs> to keep his voice down. I thought it was just some French friggin' farmer burning off the bloody blackberries. Just wait till I tell the sergeant. Darcy Crane looked forward, looking through the ranks of men. Sergeant, there's someone down here that says that the smoke is shell burst. Is that true? Because if it is, someone could get hurt if they're not bloody careful. He's being sarcastic, right? Of course it's shell burst. Andy grinned, crossing the country at least two miles off. He could see a series of zigzagging lines of trenches that ran roughly parallel like cracks in the earth. A feeling, jagged like the trenches, cut sharply through his head, through the inner terrain, it felt like a big brain. He was here, the trenches. 10,000 miles they'd come, six months it had taken, and now they were here. Um, you probably might want to make a note of anything that's describing the trenches as we read, because that's what you have to do. A couple of miles on, a couple of miles on then, said Captain Ellery, halting the company on a quiet part of the road. We will enter the supports, and depending on what is happening over the next week, we may or may not make our way up through the system to the reserve trenches or the front line. This is a quiet sector, as you can hear at the moment, and hopefully it will stay that way, although I can issue no guarantees on that score. A bullet through the ear is still a bullet through the ear. Andy, preparing to march on, saw the captain take tight hold of his stick with two hands, as if by controlling his tremors, he could eradicate them. The collars of men began to move, Andy listening to the sounds of the guns that seemed to come rolling down a distant valley. In areas on both sides of the road, sheltered by a shallow rise and fall of the ground, where soldiers and equipment, a few isolated artillery batteries hidden under camouflage netting. The smell of cooking was strong, but not strong enough to mark the element of marshy foulness that clung to the air. Marshy foulness. Someone's been spreading the blood and bone a bit thick, Bob said, by the smell of it. Um, that's the quote that you've got to refer to. That's where the title of the novel comes from. While the company went on, uh, sorry, the company went on, making way for the ambulances, lorries, and horse teams heading to the back areas where hospitals and supply dumps were placed beyond mostly the reach of the enemy artillery. artillery. On either side of the road were smashed limbers and gun carriages, the ground pockmarked with craters, and here and there the black corpses of long dead horses, some still in their traces. A cheery old place we find ourselves here, Bob said, as we tramp along with a song in our hearts. And a bard in our trousers, Darcy added, just for good measure. Andy saw a rider on a decent horse approach Captain Ellery, dismount, then point across his country to where three or four fortified holes were dug into a bank, facing away from the German line. The dark entrances to the dugouts were strengthened and protected by pillars and sandbags. The ceiling supported by less than impressive timbers, and like splintered bones, the smashed trunks of the trees stood out in front. All of it, all it needs is a nice new letterbox, Darcy squinted across the destroyed ground. I'd be quite prepared to move in, but as it is. 
and he heard a scorching, streaking sound in the sky. A monstrous whistling that turned into a screaming wail that ended in an explosion of such force he fell to his knees, his head ringing, the ground shuddering, everything lost in noise and stinging her. In front of him he saw one of the boys in the company fall, full length, still holding his rifle, one shoulder and his head replaced by an instant, vivid burst of crimson and white, the sound of shell of the shell seeming to be still crashing back and forth as the earth shivered. And he got up. The place still looked the same. The sky was blue. Bob and Darcy were getting up next to him. The wreckage beside the road was no more wrecked. The dugout still stood. He was still in one piece, but the soldier on the ground, lay ground, lay full length and straight, blood pouring from his neck like water from a culvert. Smoke rose innocently from the crater that could have quite neatly housed an upright piano. All right, then, Captain Ellery, Ellery's voice hung in the air. Andy wondered if he took his talking very slowly. It sounded like it. We'll get away from here and head to the dugout. Four of you come forward and bring boys, and perhaps one brave man to bring him. No, I will bring him. You men, off the road. Go, get to the dugout and file in. The company, except for a small group standing around the captain, moved away from the road and towards the dugout, 40 yards away. And he saw that the curls of smoke still rose from the freshly shown dirt and the harsh stick of high explosives filled the room. With the others, he walked over a truck made of joint tinted slats, seeing that a number of the faces and shooting of the boys were dotted with blood and small pieces of flesh, like the rind of some sort of strange fruit. He felt numb. He would have liked to sit down in the sun somewhere and recover, or at least think things through. Hey, you blokes over there, Darcy spoke in a strangely quiet way that Andy called through odd. Hey, Billy, yeah. uh, and Jackie, wipe your faces. Here, who's this? He pulled a handkerchief from his trouser pocket, cut through the mob of walking soldiers, and held it out. Uh, what do you think you're doing? You're not, bl- not your bloody mother. It's only, bl- it's only bloody mud. Piss off, will ya? No, don't. Darcy fished his cigarettes out, smoky, extracted a smoke for Billy, and then held the open tin out to the soldiers filing past. God bless you, my son, Darcy said to each, the boys grinning, muttering thanks, lighting up as they moved on, and me, not even a Catholic, good gracious me, Father Ryan was in the crowd. Okay, so, that's the extract, 135 to 138. What I'd like you to do is find some quotes to describe the, the, the trench. What sense is used most often? Visual and? Smell. Smell. Okay, so um, give some examples of those quotes. Um, and then move on to question two, explain the line, refer to it as the title, and then question three, um, Explain the effects of the language. And do that quietly, please. you copy a section into here and then I copy it into that.
I love how just to say what well, past it came to the swearing parts of the novel.
Now, this is our last lesson, is it? No.